And that was a song composed by your own fair hand? Yes, I, I'm, I don't really consider myself a writer, so very rarely do I record, let alone perform them. But just occasionally I, I write one that I think is quite nice. And uh, In fact, quite a lot of my stuff turns up on the flip sides of records. You know, they're not good enough to be the A side, so I put them on the other side. Well, you still make the same amount of money, don't you, if they're on the A side or the B side of a, of a hit record as you do? Oh, oh, sure. oh, yes, exactly, except you don't make it on PRS, because PRS just um, deals with what's played on the radio, and of course mm. B-sides aren't. And in fact, a lot of the money comes from that area. But I'm still interested in it for its art's sake, and I really would like to be a good writer, you know? I, you, you know, you talk about people in your programs who you've had on, in fact, who are marvellous pianists and write fantastic bits of music. I have a, quite a lot of envy for people like that, actually. Mm. Well under control, mind you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. You've also, in fact, go, going to another market as well. You've, uh, you've written uh, an autobiography called uh, Which One's Cliff. The title's a bit curious. I mean, what's the meaning of Which One's Cliff? Well, it's, there's two reasons, really. First of all, the, when the book was finally compiled, it was ghosted for me, and I spent hours cassetting things, you know, speaking onto cassettes. And um, there were so many ver various facets that we'd gone into, uh, you know, my opinions on things and the things that I'd done in the last 10, 12 years. Someone said, you know, well, you know, one wonders which one is the real cliff. But also, it comes from a little story that is in the book. Um, I was walking out with my manager. Now, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this. He has no hair and is shorter than I am. Not too much, but definitely shorter and slightly stockier. And um, uh, we were in near Stockton, Billingham. And we came out of the shop and two old ladies crossed the road and, and, and one of them said to the other one, oh, look, there's Cliff Richard. And, uh, and the other one turned around and said, oh, really, which one? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> uh, which one Cliff is a, is, a, is a bit of both things, really. Well, let's try and find out perhaps a little bit on the program which, uh, what you are about. Let's first of all talk about your music, which is one of the most important aspects of your life. Who, in fact, were the, who's been the greatest musical influence on oh, you? Oh, without a doubt, um, Elvis. You know, when, when Elvis, when I first heard, you know, well, since my baby left me, that changed um, my whole idea of pop music, because there were some um, very nice pop singers around, like the Teresa Brewers and the Rosemary Clooney's, that were sort of on the bordering of being jazz and had moved away and was something else in the middle. And I couldn't really drum up a great deal of excitement about that kind of singing. Uh, uh, and so when Elvis came along, I suddenly thought, oh, that's the kind of music I want to do. Because, mm. of course, it, it hadn't been invented until he did it. Did you ever meet him? No, I, I feel a little bit uh, uh, that I lost out there because about a year ago I had a record called Devil Woman that happened in, the, in America and I was over there promoting it and someone said to me, um, you know, if we can arrange it, would you like to meet Elvis? And I thought about it and I thought, well, he, I knew this not very well and I'd, and I'd read and seen photographs where he was about 17 stone and really, really big and just didn't look like the Elvis and he looked very sad as well. And I said, look, I, I'm sure he'll get better, I'll wait. I'll, you know, I'll wait till he's able to, you know, uh, be normal and I'd like to meet the guy that, that started me off, not this new image. And I wish now that I'd met him actually because I'd suddenly think, I'm suddenly thinking about it, uh, I was treating it exactly as a fan might, you know. I, mm. I just didn't want to uh, break an image that I had of this magnificent guy that came out and was the rebellious man with the raucous music that no one else but kids liked. I mean, what destroyed him? I mean, was that, do you think, a defect in himself or was it was he just the end product of an industry in which one sees so many casualties? I don't know that there's a complete answer. I do feel that, that um, unless you stay in touch with reality, there's every danger that you could go into an area where, where, where you believe that it, maybe it's a bit unreal. And nobody really knows Elvis, you see. Um, even the bodyguards weren't around. And the last stories I heard and, uh, that was that Elvis sort of lived in the upstairs area and wouldn't come down until was, he was ready to see everybody. So no one really knew him. And I, I feel that for a guy that gave so much, so much enjoyment, to have apparently had so little seems most unfair. And I mean, I take my own case where it's a much lesser degree, of course. Um, but for instance, I'm really known in my hometown. I mean, I, I'd go, I don't mind going to the supermarket. And I mean, this morning I was in the supermarket and I heard one lady who'd recognized me and then gone off and she didn't realize that I'd come up the same store, you know, the same, the same shelving. And she, she said to her husband, a bit untidy, isn't he? Mm. <laughs> you know? And I thought, well, I was, because I was wearing the, the, the garden jeans and, and the rough old jacket and everything, and, I, and I, I hadn't washed the bar in it, although I had shaved. But you see, that to me is a bit of reality, because that's what she was saying. She didn't know I'd heard. But uh, it was like keeping me in touch with what's, what we're really about, being yes. people. Yeah, in touch with normalcy, in fact. That's right, yeah. yeah. There must, of course, be occasions when, I mean, you just can't be normal, and you are subject oh. and prey to, to these sort of really false pressures. Oh, sure. I'm, but, but I like that. You mean, I mean, I like going to Birmingham 
and, and having a big poster up saying I'm going to do concerts and, and two houses are full and therefore everybody's excited and the lights go down and you hear everybody going oh, and I love all that but there again you see I don't live in Birmingham so I can cope with that out there mm. I can be whatever people want me to be in Birmingham I mean I, I, I get shaved and have a wash and everything and look all smart and, and the way they expect you to look on stage mm. but when I go it's, it's the going home I think I think it's it's knowing that there's an area where you are absolutely real and you can be absolutely yourself mm. and, and I, I know that people come to my home and go away a bit angry because I've, I've said look I, I'd rather you didn't come here alright sign your autograph you mean fans? yeah I mean you'll get them camping out in the garden do you? no no not camping out in the garden uh, but uh, they'll come down and I've always made it certainly in the last years as I feel I've matured as a person I've thought I need privacy and the public, most of them realize this, you know? And as I say, when you, when you say to a fan at the door, it's nice of you to come all this way, but I can't invite you in. I'm not going to sit and talk with you. I've got my family inside and I want to watch Kojak or something, you know? Mm. Um, and you sign the autograph and say goodbye. Now, some people storm off, really storm off. And it, that gives me a bit of a heart flutter for a while. And I think, well, they're not really trying to understand, you know? Mm. But what is it? I mean, you, you must have been tempted. I mean, you've been in the business now for 19 years. And you know better than I do. You've seen the, the ruination of many, many good artists in your business through mm. drugs, drink, women, a combination of all three. Right. Um, I mean, you, uh, were you ever tempted at all by any of these things in your <sighs> career? Well, the drinks and drugs. Let's deal with that one first. Yeah. Um, when I was very young, and smoking as well, I had an aversion to smoking, and I didn't like the smell of beer. I mean, so when people say to me, oh, you're enough lucky that you don't smoke, and I don't drink a great deal, but I like to drink wine and things with dinner, um, I always feel I'm very fortunate in that certain area that I never really had the feeling that I wanted to drink excessively or that I ever, I've never, ever taken a puff of a cigarette in my life. And if I had to, if I was offered a part in the film, I fear I'd have to turn it down if it meant that I had smoked, because I, I don't think I could do it. But um, naturally, the drug bit was always there, but somehow or another, I find it rather miraculous, really, I mean, I worked with bands, and looking back on it now, it was obvious that that funny smell that I smelled around the place was hash. I mean, there's no doubt about it now in my mind. I know what it smells like. Uh, and yet no one ever came to me and said, look, here's a joint, you know. Maybe it's because I just didn't smoke. Uh, maybe that's been a great help to me. Mm. And of course, I mean, everybody is, is, I mean, the whole sexuality of life is a constant temptation. I mean, of course it is. But I don't know what you mean by temptation in that, in that, in that area. What do you mean in, in, the, in, the, in the... The women area. In the women area. Yeah. You, you don't understand what I mean. Uh, I would mean by temptation... I mean, do you put it the same thing as the sort of drugs in there? Uh, no, I, no it's, not on, it's not as really as... It's not as, as, it's not as, as, as dangerous. No, right. <laughs> uh, uh, that's what I mean. No, it's not. But, um, um, no, that was, I, I didn't really mean to class it with, with that at all. But um, let's talk about that. Um, because um, it's... I mean, I would imagine what the, one of the problems would be if one were a pop star that you were constantly set, surrounded by attractive people who really, women particularly, who really wanted to go to bed with you just because you were Cliff Richard. And I would find it very difficult, or would have done, certainly at your age when you were growing up, to have uh -huh. said no. In fact, I probably found myself in bed with about 13 of <laughs> People always assume things about me um, that, <laughs> that, uh, that at the age of 18, the temptations, I didn't fall to them, you know? Um, it's like another life to me, that area. And of course there were women. I never slept around, I have to be honest and say that maybe it's a home background or whatever, but I always felt that I was going to save myself for somebody special. Um, so that helped me a great deal. But of course there were lovely people around all the time, and they still are, you know, they still are. But of course as I've got older, as my Christianity's taken a really strong grip of my life, I realize now more and more that, but, that if a woman was to enter my life, it would have to be a, a real special thing, you know? Um, and maybe it's asking too much of of people. But why hasn't that special woman entered your life, Cliff? Because, I mean, you don't exactly look like the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And you are, you are, you're a very attractive man. You've been in the, in the, in the, in this glamorous business for a long, long time. I find it absolutely sort of, uh, baffling. That well, most people do, you see. I mean, it's amazing. A lot of people think I have something against marriage. I mean, I've done interview after interview, not on television necessarily, but certainly press. And they have this thing that I don't want to be married and that I hold it all at bay. When in fact I'm sitting back and saying, I've seen happy marriages, of course I've seen them. I'm surrounded perhaps by a lot of unhappy marriages, as we all are. But I've seen happy ones work, and I can only think that the end product of that is rather nice and rather good, and therefore rather something I would rather desire. But I, when the Shadows all got married, for instance, the temptation to get married was incredible. Because suddenly I was the odd man out. But, you know, with 
I mean, everybody knows the story of people like the Shadows. I mean, they, most of them have had unhappy affairs, but are happily now, you know, with so people. Them, that's yeah. right, yeah. and, and uh, you can't meet happier people. But um, I was so glad that at the age of 18, I didn't do what I think a lot of young people do, and that is um, succumb to this pressure of marriage, uh, the whole pressure that is sexuality nowadays. No one takes it as it comes. Or maybe that's the wrong phrase. Maybe they do. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Ra rather yeah. than me rush into anything and say, I ought to be married, um, you know, Parky's a bit baffled, um, and so is the rest of the world. Uh, I ought to... <laughs> Listen, I'm not proposing to you, I'm just asking the question. <laughs> but I wonder, you see, I wonder, you see, there, there, there's a difference between being choosy and being celibate. Oh, yeah. And uh, you'll be celibate. No, but there is. And oh, you'll sure. be celibate. I mean, you've gone on record, the same, for the past 12 years. And this, no doubt, dates from, from the, that moment when you became a confirmed Christian and, That's right. and, and it became a very important part of your life. I wonder, though, how much of that celibacy was was part of the Christianity, or whether it's very much you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you don't have normal feelings. What I'm suggesting, perhaps, is that they're not as strongly developed in you as they would be in me, say. Well, I mean, that's a possibility, but that, that's to my good then, isn't it, as I'm not married? Well, <laughs> you, could look at, you could look at it two ways, please. But... <laughs> no, well, I mean, obviously, I mean, people are individual and different, and we all cope with lives um, from where we are, with what we have as our that our that is our character makeup, right. so maybe I'm able to cope without being married. As I say, I, I I look at it and think, well, it would be really nice to be married. I'd like the I like the idea of being a father. I always kid myself that I could be a good one. Um, so I mean, it's never bothered me, and it, and I know it it's a topic of conversation with most people. But I've always said, well, I'm not married, you know. And when the day that I meet someone that I want to get married to, I would get married, mm. and there's no doubt about it. Mm. This, of course, my, I must say, my, you're right. My views on marriage. Um, and, and, and sex within marriage, etc., of course have been uh, underlined in, entirely by my, by my Christian faith. Yes. Now, it's this faith, of course, um, these views that, 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 that you hold, which are, I suppose, if it'd be fair to say, are unfashionable views, certainly within the context of the industry that you're in. There aren't too many, I would imagine, who hold your kind of, of view in the, in the pop industry. Would well, that, that be fair? Yeah, I think it's yeah. fair. Perhaps more so in America, though there are probably more people yes. in America who are Christian. I, I wonder how much that, that makes you an outcast among your fellow performers. Well, funnily enough, it doesn't make me an outcast at all. I mean, I work with a really fine band of musicians who... Uh, I mean, it's been marvellous because the last two years I've felt almost rejuvenated when it comes to musical things because, um, you know, I've made records that I didn't think I would be making again. And, and I know that when I, I've just completed an album now that will come out in January, and the musicians wanted to be on my tracks. They wanted to be there, and I have their respect. I'll be doing a gospel concert tour starting next Friday, and, uh, and the musicians are all there because they want to be there, they, they, because they know musically it's nice, and, and they respect my beliefs. I mean, I don't try and ram it down their throats. Maybe that, you, that's why. You don't. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you must see again, because you're in this, this, this scene. I've seen it happen. You must see things happen when you're touring that you disapprove of people. Sure. You, I mean, uh, then what you do? Keep your mouth no, shut? No, I just say I disapprove of it. But then that's all. That to, that's goes towards uh, being the kind of person that they would respect. I mean, I, I always think the people that... that aren't true to what they believe are, I mean, are terribly hypocritical, naturally, and therefore you lose respect for people. So that, I mean, I, I make my, my stand very clear with them, and, uh, and, and they make theirs with me, you know. There's, uh, one of my band is into transcendental meditation, and we're poles apart, and yet very, very close, really, mm. because uh, we recognize in each other that, that we both recognize that we both need a spiritual uh, part of our lives. Now, at one point in your life, I think I'm right in saying about four or five years ago, you retired from the business and announced that you were going to go into religion full time. Uh, you didn't, in fact, you came back. I wonder why. Well, first of all, it was about ten years ago. Was it I'd, ten, ten yeah, years? I'd been a Christian for a couple of years, and, and, um, and a lot of Christian folks had said, my friends had said, uh, no, stay in the business. You know, you can talk to press and, and you know, go on record very publicly saying what you, what you say, and it would be a marvelous sort of testimony to, to, to God and to Jesus. So I thought, great, and I stayed, and I did my interviews, and the interviews came and went, and I thought, well, they're asking the same questions, I'm giving the same answers, it's got to be a dead-end job. And I thought, well, I cannot be a Christian in show business. And so I thought, well, I'll leave. The mistake I made, you see, Michael, was to actually call the press together and, 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 and sort of share with them the way I was feeling. And I said to them, look, I think I'm not going to stay, I'm going to leave, in fact. 
I don't know when, but I plan to go. And I cancelled my fan club and I talked with my manager and he said, if, you, if you're happy doing what you're going to do, then do it. Uh, the press jumped the gun, rather, and sort of put dates on it and made it very, very public. As I say, it was a mistake on my part. So that six months later, when I discovered that I could be a Christian in show business, and really it, it became more and more concrete when, uh, in those last days when I was thinking, this is it, I'm leaving, the Billy Graham organization reared its head and offered me a film part and said, we need a Christian who's had a film experience. And I thought, well, I, of course I'm obviously the only one. I mean, the choice is pretty small in England. So um, I, got, <laughs> I got this, uh, you mean a Christian film actor? Yeah, so somewhat, yeah. <laughs> so I, around, no? no? So I did this film, and then, even then, I still thought I'm going to leave. And then my recording manager, Nori Paramore, my then producer, said, we ought to do a gospel album, you know? Even people who don't believe sing gospel music, because it's ni nice music. And I thought, all right, I'll do that, then I'll go. And then I got approached by a television company to do six gospel um, programs, and I thought, no, wait a minute, is God actually trying to say something to me here? And I mean, I'm sure he was, and he was saying, stay, you know, of course you can make use of it. And since that time, unashamedly, I have made use of it. I haven't cut down on my other work. I mean, I still go out on tour every year, um, religiously, doing uh, my concerts for, for the public, and if they want to see me, I'm only too happy to go on tour. I still make records, I still make ordinary albums and things, I tour the world. But alongside it now, I've got this another whole... Um, I don't know, another whole aspect which makes it all so exciting for me, you know. I, it obviously gives you great strength. That's I, quite obvious. I can't remember what it was like before I was a Christian, really. I can't remember enjoying anything. Hmm. Can I ask you um, also, I mean, you're now, you've talked about being in the industry, about touring, still going on tour and this sort of thing. One wonders, I mean, you look remarkably young still, but you are 36, aren't you? No, well, that's not old. Right? No, you don't not. look 36. But I just wonder how difficult it is to maintain the image of the pop idol at 36. I mean, do people keep looking at you for lines and wrinkles? <laughs> I think it looked at me this far. <laughs> <you>, right? <laughs> well, I have to say that, you know, I never use stage makeup. You don't? No, polyfill is perfectly all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, must be, I must be very fortunate in that area again because I, I have a mother who's older than me. <laughs> And, uh, and she looks ridiculously young. Now, I keep thinking to myself, well, it must be the genes business, you know? Um, and, and if there's something that will just hold out another five or six years, <laughs> it'll be great. It might just all collapse, though, you see? Uh, and I've just got to be prepared for that. Dorian Gray, because, I mean, you used to be called Chubby Chops at one time, didn't you? I be listen, I, be I began my diet because um, the, the Minnie Colville character in Coronation Street, mm. Um, I got an honorary mention, I was thrilled, but she said, oh, I do love that Chubby Cliff Richard, and I thought, see, now, this was like 15 years ago, and I thought, but that's not the image I'm trying to portray. I'm not trying to sort of be a chubby, you know, nice little boy. And I thought, I've got to go on a diet and get thin and, you know, all that bit. And it really got me on my diet, because I didn't want to be chubby. And of course, it, I have this great incentive if you're on television. Uh, you, you want to look slim, you want to wear clothes that look with it, and, uh, and so therefore I diet. Yes. That helps, I suppose. Yes. Well, talking about chubby, our next guest is someone you know very well, and uh, he's rather chubby too, so we'll talk to him in a moment. But for the minute, Cliff Richard, thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed well, that. Thank you.